we have been studying. Uh, by the way, uh, this uh, I thought about. You know, just a little bit of snow shuts us down. The people up north think we're a clown because uh, uh, they're used to inches of snow, maybe even feet of snow. But it just takes a little shivering of snow here to uh, to close us down. And so nobody gets out, and, and we're all staying at home today. So uh, we've been studying in our church, we've been studying the book of uh, 1 Peter. And today I want to read a passage of Scripture out of 1 Peter chapter 1, beginning in verse 13. And it says, Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace of that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy. In all your conduct, since it is written, you shall be holy as I am holy. And if you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds. Conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile. Knowing that you were ransomed from the empty ways inherited by your forefathers, from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for your sake. For you who through him are believers in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Well, my goodness, there's about a dozen sermons in that passage but I want to focus on this idea of holiness. The first uh, 12 verses of this chapter and of this book, uh, Peter focuses on walking in hope. What a great idea. But the rest of this chapter focuses on walking in holiness. Now, holiness is a word that has kind of faded out or been misinterpreted and uh, misdefined in our culture today. You know, a pendulum is an interesting thing. It swings far to one side and then it swings back far to the other side. And I think I've lived long enough to see that pendulum swing. Back in the 40s and 50s, there was a lot of focus on uh, on obedience. There was a lot of focus on rules and regulations and do's and don'ts, and but not much focus on the heart, not much focus on the change in, in a person's affection. And so in the 50s, especially, I can remember uh, going to church as a boy, and all I remember hearing was, don't do this, don't do that, do this, do this, and uh, mostly don'ts, mostly don't do this and don't do that. And uh, I, I didn't think much about it. It was uh, pretty much the preaching of almost all churches at that time. It was just rules and regulations and legalistic demands. Well, that's uh, the pendulum swinging way, way over to one side. But what happened near the end of the 50s and in the 60s, uh, uh, the pendulum began to swing in the other direction. And uh, about the time that the uh, movie uh, uh, Rebel Without a Cause with James Dean came out, uh, there began to be a reaction in America, especially among young people, to this idea of, of hip hypocritical legalism. And that's what I would call it. It's what I did call it when I was... Uh, in college, when I was uh, uh, in, in the 60s, the early 60s, uh, there, was a, there was a reaction to this idea that Christianity is just about what you do and what you don't do. Well, that's ridiculous. And uh, that was what the Pharisees believed in the, in the New Testament. They were the ones 
that that had the idea that uh, 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 you, you godliness is about just obey, obeying rules. Well, rules are important. God gave us ten commandments, and then the New Testament gave us commandments. Jesus gave us commandments. The Sermon on the Mount, he actually elevated the law to an to a even higher standard. But uh, he made it clear that our righteousness has to go beyond the righteousness of of the scribes and the Pharisees. There has to be a greater, a greater righteousness. And that righteousness is not uh, a righteousness that is involved in just keeping rules. There is a, a righteousness that grows out of a heart of deep affection and passionate love for Jesus. And uh, the Bible makes it clear that uh, that that just obeying rules can actually lead us to be like whitewashed tombs. It can lead us to be like uh, graves that are painted that are beautiful on the outside but rotten on the inside. Well, in the, in the 60s, there began to be a reaction, uh, especially uh, uh, in the world. I mean, the world looked at the church and, and withdrew. And so uh, the movement that became popular in the 60s was called the hippie movement. It was a reaction against rules, and it was a reaction against religion. It was a reaction against God many times. And it was this idea of uh, uh, we've been told don't do this, don't do that, don't do this, don't do that, but we haven't been given a real reason for not doing it. And so, therefore, we're just going to, to break the rules. And the hippies did break the rules. And by the way, I, it, had I not been saved when I was 17, I would have probably been growing my hair long, and uh, I, I would have just marched right into the hippie movement. But thankfully, in the church, there grew up another group. And this group came to be called Jesus People. Started out on the West Coast and uh, people like uh, Keith Green and, and others began to emphasize this idea of passionately loving Jesus. And that was the group that I began to associate with. And my goodness, I loved the Jesus music, the Jesus people music. They began to write a bunch of new music, and second chapter of Acts and a whole bunch of other groups and, and individuals. And uh, uh, I just remember... Uh, hearing their heart, just this passionate love for Jesus, and it affected me deeply. And uh, uh, but something happened in the 70s, and especially in the 80s. The pendulum swung far, far over to the other side, and there began to be a new message coming out. Now it was a message of you know God loves us, God wants to bless us. God loves us in, in spite of who we are, in spite of what we do. And so in reaction to rule keeping, there began to be this emphasis on the grace of God just covers all of our sins and it doesn't matter how we live. We can be greedy, we can be immoral, we can, be, we can drink, we can, we can do anything that we want to do because we're now under grace. And uh, there was an element of that that appealed to me. There was an element of that that I would hear, and I thought, well, you know, the grace of God is amazing. The grace of God is so wide. It does cover everything, covers all of our sins, and grace greater than our sins. And, and so I began to kind of swing in that direction. And, uh, but I didn't swing as far because... I saw verses in the Bible like Jude verse 4 that talks about the warning that there are some people who use the grace of God to excuse sin in their life. And then in Galatians chapter 5 verse 13, another warning that we must not let the freedom that we have in Christ become an excuse for indulging the flesh. And I saw that. I thought, you know, there's, there's a balance. And by the way, the word balance, I think, has been my key word for my entire ministry because I believe that we must, we absolutely must 
live in balance of doctrines that, uh, that seem almost to be contradictory. They're not contradictory. They're actually complementary, and we need both. And so this passage tells us that God wants us to be holy. And uh, uh, as I said at the first, you know, the word holy, holiness, has kind of gotten a bad rap in our day. People picture Puritans wearing funny hats and things like that and, and uh, Salem witch trials and, and all this kind of stuff. And people saying, you know, uh, life is to be lived in a rigid uh, uh, a rejection of anything that is pleasurable and that if you're having fun of any kind, you must be sinning. Well, that's ridiculous, and that's not true, and that's absolutely not what the Puritans taught, by the way. I love the Puritans because they had the right focus. They had the focus of doing the right thing for the right reason. And that's what the Bible tells us. That's what Jesus tells us. Jesus tells us that love should motivate everything that we do. And uh, Paul makes it clear all throughout his letters that we are to obey the law. We are to keep, we are to live a, a separated life, a godly life, a holy life, but we are to do it because of the passionate love that we have for Jesus. And so uh, that's what Peter is emphasizing here. And, and uh, 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 the word holiness actually has the idea of being different. We are to live a different kind of life. There's a lifestyle that the world accepts. There's a lifestyle that the world lives and practices. And there is to be something different about us as Christians. It also has the idea of being distinct. That is, that it's set apart. It's, uh, uh, it, it is, uh, uh, again, different from the world. And it's dedicated. Things in the Old Testament that were called holy were those things that were dedicated for God's use. So we want to be different. We want to be distinct. We want to be dedicated as Christians today. And we want to do it for the right reason. And we want to do it in the right way. And so, so what is the motivation? What is it that causes us to live a godly life, to even want to live a godly life? And so he says in verse 13, preparing your minds for action. That is, we have to be determined to, uh, to, to live in a unique and distinct way because of the grace of God. The grace of God has appeared to us, the Bible says, teaching us that to... Uh, reject immorality, to turn away from sin, and to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. So the grace of God doesn't give us an excuse for sin. The grace of God gives us rather the, uh, the, the reason to hate sin and to live in a godly and a proper way. So he says, here's how we do it. We prepare our minds for action. That is, we make up our mind. We determine. Uh, uh, sometimes people say, well, you know, I, I don't believe in, in self-effort. Well, I don't believe in self-effort either as far as making us right with God, but I do believe that there, it, there must be a determined effort. We must press on. The Bible makes it clear that the Christian life is a battle. It's a war against the world. It's a war against the flesh. It's a war against the devil. And we must press on. And uh, that's what the Apostle Paul said. This one thing I do, forgetting those things that are behind, those things that are in the past, I press on toward this one thing I do. He said, I press on toward the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. And that high calling is uh, uh, holiness, to, to be like Christ, to love the Lord with all of our heart, soul, mind, and strength, and to love others as ourselves. So we prepare our minds for action. And uh, I think in the, uh, in the King James, it says to gird up your loins. That is the idea of... of uh, uh, a soldier in that day, or, or even a uh, uh, just a regular citizen, they they would have to uh, they they wore the long flowing robe, 
And when they got ready to run, they would lift up their robe. They would pull it up and stuff it into their belt so that their legs would be free. That's what he says, gird up your loins for action. That is get ready, prepare your mind, prepare your heart, prepare your life to live a godly life. And then he said, and be sober-minded. This doesn't mean just not be drunk. It means be serious about this thing. And I know a lot of people, they go to church on Sunday and they listen to the sermon and they, they enjoy it, and especially if it has a little humor in it or, or and they enjoy the music, especially if it's the kind of music they like. They enjoy the fellowship. Then they walk out the door of the church and they don't think about Jesus uh, until the next Sunday. And I, that's just ridiculous. And uh, he says here to be to be serious-minded, to, to let it be the focus of your heart, the focus of your mind, and set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. He said, just remember, Jesus is coming again. Jesus is coming back, and you want to have that hope, and that hope, the Bible says that those who have this hope purify themselves. That is, when I know that Jesus is coming again, when I know what he's done for me, and he's going to talk about that later, when I know who I am in Christ and who he is in me, it motivates me, it, it drives me to want to live a godly and a holy life, to turn away from sin. And I tell you, sin is so prevalent today, and the message, the message of the church many times in these last few years, especially the last 20 years, has been grace out of balance. It's been the idea that, you know, God doesn't care how you live. God doesn't care if you want to drink a little, if you want to carouse a little, if you want to uh, engage in immorality a little or a lot. Uh, just just go ahead because, you know, God loves you and he accepts you and, and, and ah, I'll just tell you the truth, it makes me sick, it makes me it makes me angry. And my blood's kind of, my blood pressure's rising a little bit right now as I talk about it because I see it bringing destruction in the lives of so many people. You know, it's, what's so disgusting to me is that Satan will take the message of the grace of God and use it to actually water down this, the the demands and, and the uh, commands of God to holy living, and he will do it and make people use his grace, the word of grace, as an excuse for and an occasion to indulge their flesh. I, I just, it's so disgusting because I see it destroying so many people. Just, uh, uh, even on the, the thing of alcohol, you know, I I can remember there was a time back years ago when uh, Christians just didn't drink. That was one thing Christians didn't do. They didn't, they didn't drink. And uh, I was raised uh, being taught that. My dad taught me even as a little boy, you know, you don't ever touch alcohol. And, he, and then my dad became an alcoholic. And I, I watched it destroy his life. I watched it destroy his marriage. I watched it destroy his family. I watched it crush the hearts of, of, of his children. And, and I was one of them. And, uh, and I thought, uh, you know, here, here my dad taught me not to drink. But then, but then alcohol destroyed him. And not just him, destroyed almost every male in my family. Every uncle, every my grandfathers, and uh, so I determined when I became a Christian, I began to read the Bible, and I realized that there are verses in there. Jesus drank wine and turned water into wine, and things like that. And I, I saw people, heard people uh, making excuses for drinking and things like that. And and I have Christians who who drink. Uh, they drink a beer or drink a little wine. And, I don't condemn them, but I do worry about them. I'm concerned for them because I know that every alcoholic, every person who has been damaged and destroyed by alcohol started with an excused drink. They, they made an excuse for taking that first drink. So, uh, well, I've gotten off 
track here, but I just want to I, I want to, to say this is just one example. It's just one example of how that people have let the grace of God uh, become an excuse for allowing sin in their life and practicing sin in their life. And I couldn't tell you the number of people that I talked to uh, week after week who just say, well, you know, I don't think it's wrong to do this. I think it's okay for a Christian to do that. And I think, show me in the scripture. The Bible tells us we're to live a holy life. We're to live a godly life. And that doesn't mean we're holier than others. It doesn't mean we walk around uh, judging other people and things like that. The Bible teaches that we shouldn't do that. But we judge our own self. The Bible said if we would judge ourselves, we wouldn't be judged. And so I want to live in such a way that I'm constantly letting the Word of God define for me how God wants me to live. And I want to live according to that. Not not so I can compare myself to other people, not so I can, can say, well, I keep the rules, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm better than, no, 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 that's not even what I'm talking about. I'm talking about so that I can be a pleasing son and a pleasing servant to the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's what he, he's talking about here. He says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance. Now, before we were saved, we lived thinking that, uh, that this lifestyle is what would bring us fun. We lived in ignorance. We lived with the deception of, of Satan, thinking that lust equal love, thinking that drugs and alcohol uh, equal joy or peace, and thinking that fun, worldly fun, and, and, and even sexual pleasures equaled uh, 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 love. And that, that's just, uh, that's wrong. We were deceived. Yeah, we lived in the deception of our mind. Our mind was dark. Our mind was cloudy. Satan was having a heyday. We were believing that, uh, that living in sin was, uh, was what we ought to do. Well, he says that was your former ignorance. That's the way you used to live. But, but now you've been saved. Now you've been changed. Now you have a new life. My goodness, your new life ought to look new. And if I had an old beaten, broken, uh, broke, uh, broken down car that was all just barely would run and everything like that, and, and I took it to the car dealer, traded in, and I got another one that was just as broken down and just as ugly, just as beaten and wouldn't run any better, and I'd come driving off in that, somebody would say, I thought you were going to get a new car. I said, well, this one, this is, this is different than the one I had. They'd say, yeah, but it, it looks the same. Well, look, when, when God saves us, he gives us a new heart, a new mind, a new life, a new uh, lifestyle. And so therefore, I don't live like I used to live. Peter says uh, in 1 Peter, uh, uh, in another place in 1 Peter, he said, there are those who will think it's strange that you don't run to the same excess that you used to run before you were saved. And so when you become a Christian, you get a new heart, uh, new, new affections. You, you love something that you didn't love before. When I became a Christian, uh, man, I just fell in love with Jesus, for one thing. I, I, I couldn't get enough of talking about Jesus. That's one reason I love the, the Jesus People movement in the, in the early 60s. I mean, there were a group of people, they just wanted to talk about Jesus. They wanted to, they loved Jesus. And, uh, and, and that's the group that I love to be around. Uh, so I got a new heart, but I also got a new mind. I got a whole new way of thinking. The Bible says, let this mind be in you. The Bible talks about renewing our mind through the word of God and through, through uh, the Lord Jesus Christ. God wants, I mean, if you don't think any differently than you thought before you were saved, you're not saved because salvation changes you. It changes the, what you love. 
changes what you think and it changes what you do. So our heart, our hands, and our head are all affected by the new birth. So he says, as obedient children, obedient children. We all know as parents, we know how much we want our children to be obedient. My goodness, I, 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 I loved it when my children just said, yes, sir, and they did what I told them to do, and, they, and, and it grieved me when they were disobedient. Well, look, we're children of God, and God wants us to be obedient children. It says, as obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions, that is, to the heart affections, to the love, the, the desire of your old life. So come out, come out, the Bible says, come out and be different. My goodness, uh, uh, we've been saved, we've been changed, we've been born again. Paul says to the Corinthians, says you, you, know, you used to be a certain way, but now you're clean, now you're different, now you've been changed. You're not that way anymore. So Peter is appealing to us, and I'm appealing to you to let your life be so in love with Jesus that it changes the way you think, the way you, the affections of your heart, and obviously the things that you do. And uh, uh, he's going to give us the motivation for this a little bit further. For one thing, he says, it is written, it is written, be holy as I am holy. So we belong to God. God lives in us through the person of the Holy Spirit. And so therefore he says, uh, be, be holy. Be holy as, as I'm holy. And uh, I know there are some people that make fun of this thing. What would Jesus do? Some people make fun when I'd say, you know, if, if Jesus was with you, if Jesus was, uh, uh, would you do what you do, say what you say, drink what you drink, and, and so forth, if Jesus were sitting right there with you. And I was challenged with that when I was in, in uh, college. I had a professor who said, just remember, Jesus is always with you, even when you're by yourself. And so whatever you do, anything you do, you just kind of turn and say, Jesus, is this okay? Is this okay for me to do? And you know what? That helped me a whole lot. Now, there were times I did what, uh, uh, what I shouldn't do. And it was kind of like I'd say, Jesus, why don't you kind of uh, uh, take a hike and, and I'm, about, I'm about to do something. But he didn't take a hike. He was right there. And not only was he right there, he was right here. And he was convicting me. And he would say through my spirit, uh, 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 enlivened conscience, stop it and then if I didn't stop it he would say repent of it confess it admit it and and I and I would and I'm just I'm just saying that that's what he wants from us to be obedient children and uh, and to live by the word of God it is written it is written it is written and that's what Jesus said when he was even tempted by Satan he would say it stands written it is written in the Word of God. And that's, what, that's how I want to live. I want to live my life saying, what does God say? What does God say? And I know somebody said to me one time, says, well, aren't you going to be a little embarrassed when you stand before God? And he says, uh, you know, you were just a little too strict. You, you, uh, you, you loved me a little too much. You, uh, uh, you left out some things in, in your life that it would have been okay for you to do. Don't you think you're going to be embarrassed when you stand before him? And he says, uh, I think you were a little extreme. I say, well, in the first place, I don't think I'll ever hear that. But I do think that I'll hear this. You weren't extreme enough. I, I, I don't think I'm ever going to hear God say to me, you loved me too much. I think I will hear him say, unfortunately, you didn't love me quite enough. You know, I was worthy of a lot more affection than you gave me. I was worthy of a lot more obedience than you gave me. And you trying to, to excuse certain things in your life, you, you just kind of made it okay. Well, I, I don't want to do that. God, help me. Please help me not to do that. 
I, you know, if, if I stand before him someday and he says, you know, uh, you were pretty radical. I think I'll just say, I'm glad. I don't think he's, I don't think he's ever going to say that. I, I think he's probably going to say, you weren't radical enough. You didn't love me as much as I am worth loving. And then he gives us a reason why, the reason why we should love him like that. And he says, don't you know, verse 18, you were ransomed. That is, you were saved from slavery. You were purchased. You were ransomed from the futile, the empty, meaningless ways that you inherited from from Adam and from all of your forefathers. But you were ransomed not with perishable things like silver and gold. Oh, back in those days, a slave could be bought out of slavery, but it always required a price. And usually that price was certain pieces of silver or maybe some gold. But he says, you aren't, you aren't ransomed with silver and gold. No, no, no. He says, but you were ransomed with the precious blood of Christ. Friend, Paul says, you're not your own. You've been bought with a price. I don't belong to me. I belong to the one who purchased me. I belong to the one who redeemed me. I belong to the one who, who paid for my freedom. And he paid for it, not with money, not with silver and gold, but he paid for it with the silver of his tears and the gold of his blood. He purchased me. He purchased you. I am his. You are his. And he, he says, therefore, therefore, glorify God in your body. Look, in your body, because he has bought you. And uh, he says, through him, you are believers in God, the one who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Look, I'm serious about asking you to be serious. That's what I'm saying. We need to be serious about Christian living. And if... Uh, if it calls for laying aside some stuff, if it calls for turning off the television because it's filled with filthy words and, and sexual uh, 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 emphasis and things like that, then, then, then turn it off. Uh, again, you know, we can live without a lot of the filth in the world, and we should. We can live without a lot of the the stuff that is contradictory to the holiness of God. And you say, well, I don't want to be a prude. I don't want to be some kind of Puritan. I don't want to be some kind of, a, 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 you know, a radical, a weirdo, Jesus person. Well, I do. I do. I want to be a radical Jesus person. And I want to live in such a way that I can stand before God at the judgment seat of Christ and hear him say, well done, good and faithful servant. And I, I know there are things in my life that I'm still working on. There are things that I want to lay aside. That's what Paul said to the Ephesians and to the Colossians, to lay aside, lay aside all those dirty things, all those things that are, are against the, the love of Christ and put on Christ, put on holiness, put on godliness, and I want to be dressed in the righteousness of Jesus, not just for salvation, but for my continuing sanctification in this life. And again, uh, I, I am not suggesting that we go back to the 50s. I'm not suggesting we go back to a hypocritical external religious keeping of rules without a, a heart of passion for Jesus. But I'm also rejecting the idea that, uh, that we could, could love the Lord with all our heart and love him passionately and live a, a worldly, 
ungodly, unholy life. So I'm saying let's balance it. Let's let the pendulum stop swinging. Let's let it come to dead center. Let's let the pendulum stop where it needs to stop, where we have a passionate heart for Jesus, knowing that we've been saved, redeemed, bought, belong to him, and let us love him with such a love that we say, Jesus, I want to, uh, I want to, to live in a way that demonstrates that I love you. I want my actions. I want to limit some things. I want to lay some things aside. I don't want to justify worldly living. I want to live in a way that absolutely shows me as well as others that you are the greatest treasure in my life. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, thank you for loving us with such an amazing love. Uh, I, we can't describe it. You, you, you say it's indescribable. It, it, it's, it's more than we can imagine. The idea that we were enemies of God, we were, we were sinners, and Christ loved us and died on a cross in agony and shame, and he did it for me. He did it for each of us. And now we have received him and the love of Christ has been shed abroad in our heart by the Holy Spirit. Help us, Father, to reject any message or any idea that would in any way justify loose living, sinful living, cheap living, and help us magnify your grace by loving you with all our heart and letting us live that out in everyday uh, behavior, relationships, the words we speak, and the things we do. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. God bless you.